Hello and welcome to the seventh episode of Piano Lessons. Mark and Phil here again from Harney's. Today we have the really exciting world of the Three Arrows Capital um, investigation. We have something around MasterCard, something around the joke DAO, which I know you want to get into, uh, Mark. Jamie Diamond makes an appearance and, of course, the Mango Hack. Welcome to Piano Lessons. This is the penultimate one, I believe. It is. Uh, very, very emotional for, for the end of uh, Series 1 coming up in our finale. Um, we have the exciting announcement today that both Mark and I will be there in person at the Coin Outs um, conference. I think you'll see down below a link to the conference itself. Um, we will be in San Francisco in the first week of November. Look forward to seeing anyone that wants to come and join us straight into the recital, Mark. So lots of international legislation going on at the moment. Uh, Japan focusing on the AML laws in this industry. India focusing on their sort of tech focused regulatory framework. And obviously, you've got the Financial Stability Board setting out plans for this sort of global regulatory framework to deal with systemic risk. And I know you want to come on to that later. I'm sure you saw, given the miner that you are, that, that it took over an hour to mine a block of Bitcoin on Monday, um, leaving thousands of transactions in an unconfirmed state. Interesting one, that one. Um, Paradigm, our, our favorite topic of the Yuki Dow. Paradigm became the third entity to try and join this case, uh, arguing that CFTC should identify and try and serve its lawsuit against individual members rather than the Dow as a whole collective. Um, US regulators are favorite friends in all of these, uh, the CFTC and SEC included looking into 3AC again, trying to see for a high, wide range of possible violations on the US side. Uh, we talked about Visa, I think, and FTX last week. This week, we've got MasterCard joining with uh, Paxos to help banks offer sort of some form of crypto trading through the verification of transactions and to help banks follow compliance rules, which is great. Joke DAO, which I have to say is one of my favorite launches so far, wants to make DAO governance fun. Um, I'm sure you've entered already, but they have a weekly joke writing contest. Um, everyone then votes on and the second most popular um, joke of the week gets 20% of the NFT sales. It's actually a really cool idea and I'd love to get into that at some point. But what you really want to get into on the recital is uh, our favorite friend, uh, the JP Morgan CEO, Jamie Diamond, who surprised no one as he, uh, as, he as he held stage at the Institute for International Finance events in uh, DC, I think last week, uh, calling crypto tokens decentralized Ponzi's. Uh, notwithstanding the fact he actually gave a little bit of praise to, um, to to the blockchain community, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, this guy, he blows hot and cold on this. And meanwhile, the bank itself is offering to their clients by demand exposure to certain ETFs and certain assets of the, of the crypto market. I yeah. kind of agree with him, though. Some of them are decentralized Ponzi's, but not all of them. There's some real value here. We'll We'll look at some of these later on. But I think it's important to note that if these are all just decentralized Ponzi's, then very serious regulators are paying attention. So serious, in fact, they probably wouldn't be part of JokeDAO. And we had last week a report published by the Financial Stability Board that very few people have heard of, uh, and they are focused on global financial stability. In 2018, I hosted a panel at the International Bar Association in Amsterdam. We had a person from the Italian Central Bank wasn't particularly worried about systemic risk for crypto. It was just not that big. This FSB report last week definitely changes the stakes. They're now looking at the potential for stable coins, crypto assets, et cetera, et cetera, and the services to potentially be systemically important. The value locked up, the intertwining with the financial system. This is a big shift. And although they're going to look at a comprehensive global regulatory framework for systemically important crypto assets, there's some really interesting comments in there, particularly around DAOs and decentralization in uh, in air quotes and it could set the direction of travel for a renewed approach to looking at this sector as a serious player in the financial space so when dimmer makes those comments as he's wont to do using his um, various colorful analogies i think it's worth noting that he may have his view and that view obviously has a lot of weight but there, it, 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 there's a much bigger play on the horizon here this is becoming a really important part of the financial system and they're seeing the potential for that to become even more so I think nicely moves into the piano solo. Obviously, we had a another very high profile sort of hack, um, the, the, the Mango hack. Uh, I think around 140 million. Um, I, I, I can't wait to hear this one because I found it quite amusing, as, as I'm sure you did, ignoring the sort of cost. And I should say that they're, they're announcing sort of at the moment uh, an attempt to, to pay that back, which is which is fantastic. Um, and obviously, it not only caused the hack, but also the 500 million I think dollar loss in, in Solana TVL which is a whole part of this. But the fascinating part, again, on our favorite social media platform, Twitter, 
was that the hacker themselves came on Twitter and said this was fully legal and actually it was just an aggressive investment strategy. So really can't wait to hear your solo on the Mango Hack and, and generally sort of what this means for, for, for the industry as a whole. All right. So I've got to cover a lot in a really short amount of time here. DeFi platforms and protocols, they're really, really complex. And they have all sorts of interlocking factors. Um, they use oracles, which are some of them are faster than others. And depending on the amount of leverage and capital you deploy, you can really stress test what these protocols can do. And there's a very interesting article on a Substack by a guy who did some investigation into this and actually knows the person who did it, who um, part of their handle on Twitter is or, or Discord is the honest man. And he gamed this out, said exactly what he was going to do, did it, got the money, and then was also able to control enough of the voting tokens that he was able to put on the DAO a governance proposal saying, ah, <laughs> if this guy gives it back, um, he will like us not to take any criminal action against him. Do you agree to these terms? And used his control of the tokens to vote yes. Uh, yeah. So it's a perfectly legitimate vote. Unless you've got governance proposals to annul some sort of consensus hack, then you, you're stuck with that proposal. I think that's an argument for strong governance bylaws and rules around DAOs, and sometimes that doesn't get the attention it deserves. But the Mango mm -hmm. Hack as a whole shows that how complex these systems are, the really important yeah. need to stress test but with the amount of value on these protocols, this is why the FSB is coming out with these reports. And you know, who's going to regulate them? How are they going to regulate them? By what standards? We don't know. But it just goes to show that it no nothing was necessarily exploited here, or there wasn't necessarily any kind of breach of security systems. It was just a gamed out strategy. Now, whatever your views on that and the morality of it is, is up for debate. But the more complex these protocols are, the more value they hold, the more you have to really look at every single possible vector by which this can be stressed. And it also shows the importance of making sure you've got good, strong uh, rules around how your DAO votes and ways of appealing or potentially overruling votes that might have been obtained in, in some sort of breach of consensus mechanism. Thank you, Mark. Um, finally, Piano Tuner, uh, another one that I think a lot of people will be interested in the answer for. So uh, let, me, let me ask the question. There have obviously been some very high profile NFT purchases through the years. Um, we, we've seen some incredible value that are now nowhere near the, the value that was originally purchased for them. Why has this happened? And when will these prices increase, Mark? It depends. Uh, the you got to be careful with these hypes and, and, and crazes that come through because people had quite a lot of liquidity sloshing around and made quite a lot of money when the, uh, the crypto market was high. And they were a new thing and they were cool. They were exciting and they were seen as revolutionary. And, and like most of these new uh, fans that come along, people drop a lot of money into it. And then the excitement dies down a bit and the market goes down a bit. And suddenly people aren't willing to pay as much for them as the original purchaser. And all of these things have subjective value. Nothing has intrinsic value. So it's whatever people are willing to pay for it. I think if you bought something expecting to flip it for a massive profit, then you, you, you're no better than gambling in a casino or speculating. And I said this at the event that we hosted in February here about the art of NFTs. The line doesn't always go up. So buy some art you like and you buy anyway. And if someone else likes it too, or if it's a good collector or it's a good artist, then maybe there'll be some resale value, but that's not why you're buying it. Um, NFTs have a huge use case and purpose beyond digital art. And the value could be you know, more objectively measured in some cases, but it's very hard to value art anyway. So depends why you bought it. Depends what you're hoping to get from it. But I think if you bought art you like, then the value there is is what you think it was worth in the first place. So if you engage, if you engage in that circus of speculation and flipping, uh, I think you've probably been disappointed and lost quite a bit of money now. But there are some really good art-related NFTs by some really good artists, and they could genuinely hold their value. So it, we don't know when it's going to come back or if it's going to come back or how it's going to come back. But I don't think that's why you should be in this space in the first place. Absolutely. And the obvious point to make is that not all NFTs are focused around the JPEG world and art. There, there, there are some incredible projects we've been involved with ourselves that have some really interesting use cases and properties that allow people to do some fascinating things with, with their NFTs going forward. Um, and so it really is taking a careful look of what you want this thing for and what you want to use it for. And that might be art. That might be to go meet your favorite pop star. Who knows? But, 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 but the excitement is there. But as you say, the speculation is uh is is something you're just going to have to accept you need it though to drive interest and in development of the space precisely thank you mark thanks phil